the most beautiful blessing of being able to offer these teachings. So just to be together in a group and to feel that sense of connection, it's certainly bringing me through these difficult times of prolonged isolation now at this point. So, and this is the thing, isn't it? You know, sometimes we encounter um, things in life that we really don't have much control over. You know, nobody could have predicted the pandemic. Nobody can ever really predict what happens in the political arenas in life. Um, so many things that we're going through as a, a global community at the moment. And of course, you know, with social media and constant kind of news input, everything feels as though it's happening just around the corner. And sometimes we can really forget to, um, to look at where our real refuge lies and to really find that refuge, to even cultivate and develop that refuge within ourselves, which can actually learn to lean into where joy, gratitude, happiness, even celebration of life and the beauty in life can be found. And so these are the times that the Brahma Viharas can really be of great support. And uh, today we're talking about mudita, which um, is often translated as sympathetic or um, vicarious or altruistic joy. So it's a kind of joy that is actually um, um, increased by rousing um, thoughts of beautiful qualities within ourselves, thoughts of things we have to be grateful for, but also learning to tune up to the happiness in the world and to the success um, and to the joy that others experience. Yeah, It can be material success or gain. It can be qualities that we see in others that are really admirable. You know, it really can range from anything. There's this beautiful... Um, uh, social media group called the Kindness Pandemic, which uh, was set up at the beginning of COVID, of the COVID crisis. And I go on there from time to time just to read really beautiful, inspiring stories of um, people's generosity and goodness. And you can see from reading the stories just how that encourages others to also uh, partake in just being that bit more generous and going the extra mile to bring a bit of joy to somebody else's life. You know, recently I read about one um, young teenager who's very shy and quiet and he was growing his hair, really, really long hair. And his mom just thought, OK, you know, this is what teenagers do. They grow really long hair. Um, but the whole intention of doing that was so that he could then um, donate it to cancer research to somebody who'd lost their hair, you know, through undergoing chemo. And he just did that very quietly in his own way because he found it was something he could do to serve. Yeah. And then we can also read of really extraordinary things that people do. Like Ajahn Brown reminded me recently of um, the time that there was a truth and reconciliation process um, started by Nelson Mandela and I think um, Desmond Tutu in South Africa. And um, the idea of this was so that people could come forward, people who'd you know, perpetrated crimes, mostly racism, um, against others in South Africa. And um, the idea was that they wouldn't be punished if they would come forward and confess and tell the truth about what had happened. And so um, this one uh, white police officer came forward in front of the wife of a, her husband who he tortured to death, basically. And he confessed exactly what had happened. You know, this woman had lost her husband. She hadn't known what had happened and wanted some closure. And he told it in all its detail, you know, crying and sobbing. And she managed to jump past the security guards and approach this person running at him. And everybody sort of took a breath, sort of what's going to happen next. And what she did was to throw her arms around him and to say, I forgive you. Thank you so much for, for letting us know what had happened. I forgive you. you know? This is extraordinary. And these are the kind of things we can look at to inspire ourselves, to uplift our heart. Yeah. So gradually it helps us, this quality of mudita, of sympathetic joy, to not to avoid the suffering in life, not to whitewash it, but to learn to tune in to the beauty in humanity, to the beauty in our own hearts, and also the kindness and goodness in the world. Yeah. So it can be people's material success also. And this is where it can be really helpful in overcoming qualities like, well, not a quality really, but um, 
envy or resentment, jealousy that can arise to block that ability that we have to um, actually delight when other people are happy. Yeah. Some of the time when other people are happy, it can actually make us feel worse if we look at it in the wrong way. You know, if we look at it in a comparative way, we say, oh, it's so unfair. This person's having this and that success. They hardly seem to work for it. Whereas I work so hard and things seem so hard for me. But I think this is often um, just because we haven't learned to really appreciate what we have in our life. Yeah, we haven't really learned to look at just the miracle of waking up and being able to take a breath. I mean, it sounds so small, but that shows that we're alive. We're really truly alive and we can become present to that just in the short moment of one simple in-breath and out-breath you know just we can do that now together just really allow yourself to breathe and just to arrive you know we have clean air to breathe nobody is suffocating us nobody is oppressing us right now a lot of the oppression comes from our own inner attitudes and limitations that we impose upon ourselves. You know, we can go downstairs and turn the tap on. We can drink the water. It's clean. We're not going to infect ourselves with bacteria or parasites. We can turn on the lights. You know, we can read. We can find so many inspiring things to uplift us. You know, and we can also think about how we can serve others in this world. So these are really beautiful things. I read something nice by uh, Michelle Obama yesterday. She said that um, she decided to uh, enter the domain of public service for entirely selfish reasons because she, would, she knew how much happiness and inspiration it would give her to dedicate her life to the service of others. And I thought that was just so beautiful, you know, because it makes us very happy when we can see others happy too. And really, if we reflect carefully, I mean, how does it serve us when others suffer? When others are suffering, basically their hearts are probably going to be more closed down and contracted. You know, perhaps they feel that they don't have enough in the sense of lack can cause competition, can cause jealousy, envy, even, you know, fighting and war. So it really doesn't serve us if other people are struggling, if other people are unhappy and are not experiencing success and joy in their life. You know, so reflecting in these ways can really help us to come out of those kind of narrow attitudes which would cause us to um, wish harm on another or, or especially if that person happens to be a so-called enemy, we don't really wish for their success. Their success doesn't make us feel very happy, right? But when we reflect that everybody, when they're in a good state of mind, has more capacity to really serve and bring that happiness, share that happiness with others, and so contribute to the alleviation of suffering in the world, then we can learn to rejoice in their success. Whether we think they deserve it, they've earned it, it's, it's fair, um, we can still rejoice. But of course, you know, the best causes for rejoicing are when people have really um, developed their heart in the Dhamma and, and develop remarkable qualities of mind. So in a sense, the more noble and sublime a person's happiness, the more we can really genuinely rejoice for them. So I wanted to talk about um, the Mudita as one of the Brahma Viharas also and how it relates to the other Brahma Viharas and helps to balance them out in a sense. Um, and so I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with the Buddha's teachings, but um, the word Brahma was traditionally used to mean a being who lives in a godlike state of mind. And whether you consider that as an actual realm of existence or not, it doesn't really matter. But what it means is that they live dwelling with a heart of unlimited goodwill and love, loving kindness, and a heart that's free from enmity. It's free from miserliness in this case, or jealousy, stinginess, yeah, that would contract and close down the heart. And so these are very sublime states of mind where the heart, the mind is expansive and it's soft. And of course, you can see that from a soft heart, an expanded heart, there's a certain resilience there. There's a resilience to the um, vicissitudes of life, you know, to criticism, to um, people wanting to hurt you because your heart is just so big and expansive. It's almost like something will hit it and it will just sort of bounce off. You know, you, you're light, you're resourced, you're resilient. Um, 
and I was li listening to a TED talk the other day by a woman called Lucy Hone, and she said that there are three um, qualities of resilience in people. And one is to understand that suffering does happen and it doesn't mean that anything's gone wrong with your life if you experience suffering. You know, so one example I had of that was to um, when my dad was diagnosed with leukemia, I think in 2011 now, and it was some time ago. And of course, it's the last thing you want to hear that somebody you love and that you're close to is, um, you know, diagnosed with cancer. But I remember the thought came to my mind at that moment. Well, other people's dads get cancer, so why not mine? You know, and apparently this is one of the... Um, the qualities or the responses that causes more resilience because we understand that you know suffering is universal and we're not exempt from that we can almost expect that right and yet at the same time we know how to direct our attention yeah towards um first of all the places that we can affect change but also learning to tune in to the happiness that is available and it is uh, very much a part of life and then the other thing that um, Lucy was saying was uh, an aspect of resilience, was being able to reflect and ask the question of yourself, is what I'm doing helping or harming me? And apparently this has been studied scientifically, and this was the most um, potent question and the one most likely to bring about greater well-being for oneself and others, just to be able to reflect in that way, is the way that I'm using my mind helping or harming me? and others. This would always be very important in Buddhism because all of these Brahma Viharas should be developed to all as to oneself. So Mudita is not just this place where we dwell like the Brahmas in this divine abidings. <clears throat> it's also an expansive state that includes all beings and that's what makes them really Appamana. Appamana means um, like immeasurable states. So it's going beyond one's own personal happiness to extend that same well-wishing, that same rejoicing in the well-being of others to all beings, whether we like them or not, uh, whether, you know, we like what they do or not. Um, and in this way, it dissolves the barriers between beings. Apparently, um, it's easier for us to have empathy towards people who look like ourselves or who've been brought up in similar ways to ourselves. But the Brahma Viharas go beyond those boundaries and help us to empathize with all beings, whether they look like us, whether they are the same gender or a different gender, the same sexuality or a different sexuality. We see our common humanity. <clears throat> and we understand that all beings, you know, desire happiness and recoil from pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. So not only are these unconditional states of mind, they're also impartial in the same way that the sun would shine on all beings equally. So although sometimes, for example, metta is compared to the love of a mother for her only child, that unconditional love that no matter what that child does, no matter how they turn out, you still wish only the best for them. The difference is that we have to generate these feelings to all beings as though they were our only child. So then it be, it's beyond partiality, yeah. It's to all beings, as I say, whether they are like me or whether they are liked by me, it doesn't matter, they're human beings or sentient beings, right? This also goes to animals as well. And I read a very touching story um, yesterday uh, about this lady, I think she's in America in quite a cold part of the country. And she had a little bird who's been with her for like years. So it's always been a domesticated bird and it's her constant companion. It sounds a bit strange. And there was a video of this little bird, really tiny little fluffy thing that would live on her shoulder. And um, I think this lady lives alone because she said this is her main companion, right? And she really loves this little bird called Sally. Anyway, this woman had been out to the dentist, I think, yesterday or a couple of days ago. And because of that, she wasn't quite thinking very clearly. Normally she wouldn't take the little bird outside in kind of strong winds or stormy weather, but she didn't realize the bird was sitting on her hoodie when she went outside. She entered this big blast of cold wind and sleet and terrible icy temperatures, and the bird got blown off into the wilderness. 
And so she put this post up on uh, her social media account, <laughs> trying to avoid the word, you know what? Anyway, <laughs> her social media account. And, uh, <laughs> and, and she said, I'm devastated. You know, this little bird was my constant companion and she's gone. There's no way she can survive. She's been brought up indoors. She loves to be indoors. She never ventures out in that kind of weather and there's no way she'll find food. So she was absolutely devastated and grieving for the next two days. And then today I found that amazing story. She reported back that there was one person in the town who'd known that her bird had gone missing. And this one person also knew that the bird had like um, a damaged beak. And because of that could only eat sort of liquidized food. This bird had actually ended up finding that one person in the city where she lives, <laughs> turned up at the uh, pet shop that that person owned and basically had, had, had found safety. And so that person, that one person who knew the bird and knew who it belonged to was able to contact this woman and she um, was reunited with this little bird. So I tell this story also because it made me feel so joyful, obviously, because of the suffering she went through and then the beautiful, you know, outcome, but also to show that even birds, little birds that seem so insignificant, have such a great intelligence because apparently they were oriented by the sound of the, what was it, budgeries or canaries, I think, in that pet shop, um, because the lady who owns the bird used to own canaries. And somehow the sound of that was like a landmark for that little bird. And she even posted a video to show that she wasn't making this up. And the little bird was just there, at the door sort of outside this pet shop on the floor. And then the pet shop owner, the one person who <laughs> knew about this bird and knew that she'd gone missing, found her just like that. So beautiful. So reading these kind of stories can so uplift the heart, you know, and also bring us in touch with that um yeah that feeling that we're so intimately connected we're fragile right all beings are so fragile and rely on each other for connection simply to survive and we're no different with that we're no different at all so how do these brahma viharas relate to each other and i think it's important to see the connection especially between mudita and compassion another of the brahma viharas right so metta, metta, loving kindness is the first and most foundational of these four. In a way, that's like the basis from where the others can develop. It's a sense of universal loving kindness and goodwill. And it's the antidote to ill will, hostility or aversion yeah, that can arise in the mind. And that includes aversion or hostility towards ourself and even towards our meditation object, right? Sometimes we can struggle with the breath and we can actually develop some kind of aversion or slight kind of suspicion maybe, or a sense that this breath is something I need to dominate and control. So this really helps to soften that aversion, that sort of negativity. And metta is different from sentimentality. It's different from attachment. So it's something that frees and expands the heart. So in a sense, what we can say about the other Brahma Viharas is that there are ways that love responds, that same love, that same loving kindness responds when it meets different situations. So compassion is how loving kindness and goodwill responds when it encounters or meets suffering in this world or suffering in other beings. Yeah. When we meet somebody who's going through great distress, for example, they've been parted from their little animal companion and feel that, you know, partly responsible for that. It wouldn't be correct, it wouldn't be appropriate to say, well, may you be happy, you know, because they're not happy, visibly not happy. And so the kind of sentiment, oh, to first of all resonate with their suffering and to understand it and then to wish, may you be free from that suffering, may you find a way through your grief and, and find joy again. This is much more uh, appropriate. And so they say that, you know, compassion is the way that a mother's love would respond to her child when the child is sick. And compassion is the opposite to cruelty. It's the antidote to, Ill, to harming, violence, yeah? So it also includes that aspect of being very gentle um, and, yeah, and, and, and focusing on non-harm. What can we do to, to make ourselves people who are trustworthy, who are safe to be around, you know, the kind of friend who can be there for you through thick and thin. They don't just run away when you're struggling. 
<laughs> this is someone with compassion. They can hold your pain when you're unable to hold it for yourself. But compassion can sometimes feel a little bit heavy, you know, especially if we are of the empathetic type and we resonate too much with others' distress, it can move into what they call empathetic distress. And mudita, loving kindness that responds to others who are happy, who are experiencing joy, success. Mudita can balance that compassion because it's also recognizing that whilst there's great suffering in the world, there are also many, many reasons to rejoice and to, um, and to notice that many people are doing well like I would really say straight away, everybody here, well done, you know, give yourself a bit of a tap on the back because you, you came here, right? Even though you felt anxious, even though you were feeling tired, you were thinking that well, maybe I can't even sit up to meditate, still, you knew that this is where your well-being really lies in, you know, just offering yourself the opportunity to tune into how you're feeling and to incline your mind gently towards joy. And joy doesn't have to be kind of like fireworks that are exploding, like full of bliss. It can be something very subtle, just, you know, something as subtle as looking at your own virtue. The fact that you probably, I'm guessing, haven't, you know, shouted and abused somebody this morning. And if you have, well, hey, you probably didn't beat them up, right? <laughs> it could have been so much worse. And just look at your beautiful purity of intention in wanting to develop in the Dharma and to offering that support to the group because every single person who's here is valuable as part of this group. Believe me, as from my perspective of sharing the Dhamma, it wouldn't be possible without being able to tune into you somehow. And so just seeing people's faces and the sincerity in your faces is already, you know, helping me to, to generate joy in myself and to feel that joy of serving. So everybody is absolutely welcome. And as a group it's just quite an overwhelming amount of goodness here that's gathered so there's so much to rejoice in in the world and so mudita can help compassion when it starts to go into kind of melancholic brooding you know just to bring that bit of lightness and perspective um, to the world and to our attitudes and, and outlooks on the world the buddha said that whatever we frequently uh, reflect on and think about becomes the inclination of our mind yeah the power of one thought to create your reality cannot really be underestimated and over time when we continue to have thoughts in a specific sort of um with a specific leaning so for example bringing up the things that there are to rejoice about writing a gratitude journal you know every evening before you go to bed three things that you're grateful for today perhaps things that others have done, perhaps things that you've done or qualities in yourself that you admire, or that at least you can recognize, right? And wish to in increase and purify and strengthen. Or, yeah, I mean, I find this really helpful. It just helps to start directing the mind in a different way. And you'll find that you'll wake up in a different mood than if you'd have gone to bed just carrying all the stresses and strains of the day. So it starts to give a more balanced perspective. And at the same time, we can say that neither are completely accurate, right? Because until we're actually free from hindrances and we're able to see things truly as they are, all our perceptions are going to be conditioned and are going to be in some way biased. But who cares, right? Who cares? If we have some influence over how we construct our world, how we construct our emotions, shape our emotions, shape our relationships, then surely it makes sense to shape them in ways that lead to the wholesome qualities increasing, yeah, to the well-being and happiness of ourselves and others. And, and this, in this way, we become architects of our own happiness. Yeah. We're no longer just the victims of circumstance, the victims of whatever happens to us, but we start to take some kind of control. Control is a strange word, so I'd rather say it's a kind of learning to influence or learning to shape, learning to fabricate in a wholesome way. So I did want to, um, <laughs> as usual, I have too much to share, but um, there were two main ways that I wanted to talk about Mudita. And the first one was um, in terms of understanding how it arises and how we can create the foundation for it, the preparation for it in our daily life. So through, like I say, the way we start 
to think, the way we reflect on situations that happen in order to undermine what we call the five hindrances. Yeah, and the five hindrances will stop us from accessing much more expansive deep states of meditation where mudita can really start to be generated in a universal way. So I wanted to talk about that and then later today talk about how we can develop mudita in a sense of spreading it in every direction. So at the deeper stage of meditation as a cultivation of the heart. So first I wanted to read a little quote out to show how um, these qualities become qualities that can spread, but also that in the beginning we have to be free from a certain, from some of the coarser um, obstacles to meditation. Yeah. So this is from the Kalama Sutta, and the Buddha says that someone practicing, here it says a noble disciple, but it really means anyone who is practicing. This person is devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, unconfused, clearly comprehending, ever mindful, and then dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with altruistic joy. Likewise, the second, third, and the fourth, above and below, across and everywhere, to all as to oneself, one dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with altruistic joy with mudita, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity and without ill will. So here we can see that already some of the preparation work has been done, right? Devoid of longing, ill will, unconfused, clearly comprehending, ever mindful. So this is talking about a disciple in higher training. So this is someone who really has reach that stage of freedom from these things but for us we can at least learn to weaken them and one way we can do that is by starting to learn about the law of cause and effect karma and to start to understand that our intentions basically um, determine the quality of our lives so when we um, think or act from a pure mind the buddha says in the dhammapada um, happiness follows like a never departing shadow and on the other hand, when we act or speak with an impure mind, with a mind that's full of um, cruelty or desire or ill will, then of course it's the opposite. And, and the Buddha says that suffering follows us like the um, cart of the um, ox cart follows the ox. It's a little bit of an old fashioned, obviously 2,600 years ago um, image but I've been in Burma actually sitting on one of those ox carts so I can understand what's meant there. You know, the two are yoked together. And if your thinking and behavior, you know, and speech is coming from a place of negativity, a place of harm, then how can we be expect to be happy? It's impossible. You know, planting the same causes and expecting different results, they say is the work of fools, right? So we have to learn to plant wholesome seeds. And also remember that just because we do come from a positive state of mind, it doesn't mean we're going to experience happiness right away, okay? So this is one of the differences between Buddhist understanding of um, ethics and happiness and the psychological understanding. So in psychology, they say, apparently, positive psychology says that um, if, we feel, if we do something good, or, then we feel happiness straight away. And you know, if we feel happiness straight away, that shows that we did something good. But in Buddhism, we don't say that because sometimes it can be difficult to do the right thing. Sometimes the effects aren't immediate and we're much less concerned with immediate feelings of well-being and sort of, you know, um, feelings of well-being which are more tied up with the sensual world than we are in long-term happiness. And long-term happiness has an ethical dimension to it. So it's a culmination of all the good intentions and of all the you know, beautiful acts of body, speech, and mind that we do in an ongoing way. This creates happiness for us that's more stable and lasting and that can go long into the future. So we never know when those results will arise. It takes a little bit of faith sometimes to trust that we're on the right track, but slowly you'll start to feel that a different kind of happiness starts to develop within you. And it's not the kind that's based or reliant or dependent on sensual desires, yeah? So, and then of course, if we learn to shape 
our intentions in wholesome ways, this affects our conduct in daily life. Our minds become more buoyant and happier. And I don't know about you, but I ask myself, well, you know, when I'm happy, aren't I more likely to share? Aren't I more likely to do good and to help others? You know, when you have that happiness, it just bubbles over, it spills over to others. So, you know, we do start to be able to be more generous in our speech as well as our actions. Sometimes people think they've got to be generous in a material way, but you can also be generous in the way you offer encouragement to others, you offer praise, you boost them up when they're feeling low, and you rejoice when they're actually experiencing success. Instead of saying, oh, or thinking to yourself, why did that happen to them? It should have happened to me. You know, we can actually think that's great. You know, may they not be parted from their gains. May they, you know, continue to increase in happiness and enjoy. Yeah. In Buddhism also, we have this practice of um, anumodana. It means rejoicing with others when they do an act of goodness. So for example, this year I did my first uh, three month retreat in England and it was a solitary retreat here in Oxford. And, uh, you know, I was a little bit like, how is that gonna feel to meditate on my own, uh, to have to create the atmosphere on my own? you know, not being held in a retreat center where there's already a good energy of meditation, but to create a sort of similar setting that can hold me through basically whatever I might go through in that three months. But um, I took the advice of my teacher and made contentment my goal. And um, there was so much to rejoice in, you know, first of all, from people who were offering me food and vegetable boxes throughout that time and keeping me so well nourished. One of the great privileges of being a nun is that I really do get to see people's goodness and kindness. The fact that I'm still here, right? The fact that I'm able to eat every day is purely due to others' goodness and kindness because we don't charge for these teachings, you know? There may be a little registration fee sometimes that goes to the organizers, but nothing is charged. So if that Dhamma is not important to people, if they're um, if it doesn't mean very much to people, then my livelihood will not be sustained. I won't be able to continue. So it's because of their generosity, both at the material level, but also, you know, their love for the Dhamma that I can exist as a nun and I can live this life and we can think about developing a monastery. So this is very present with me and it sustained me throughout the retreat. There was so much gratitude welling up every time I receive a vegetable box or a, a delivery from the supermarket. It was... Uh, really, really touching. But also at the end of the retreat, we organize what's called a katina ceremony, which is where um, an offering of a new robe is made to the monastic community. And uh, our ex-treasurer Tehani organized that and, um, and had a robe made to my measurements in Sri Lanka and had it brought over here. But when she offered this, you know, it was all over Skype. So it was kind of not Skype, Zoom. So it was kind of strange, you know, because we weren't there in person to do it, but she offered it online and she invited everybody else in the room to join in with the merits, to join in with the sharing and to, you know, allow their hearts to be uplifted by this beautiful act of kindness and goodness and celebrating the first three month retreat that we've had, you know, in a bhikkhuni residence in the UK. So there's also this way to do good and then share it with others. So if you feel somebody struggling or even if they're already doing well, you can also bring to mind any of the good things that you've done and share the effects of that with them. Yeah. So I think there was a lot more I wanted to say, but I also want to give you some time to meditate and we'll have longer in the afternoon to uh, talk about other aspects of Mudita and how to develop that. So let's start this morning with uh, a little practice on bringing up some of the goodness in our own hearts and just learning to lean into any joy that's present for you this morning. Good. So please get as comfortable as you can. We'll sit for about 35 minutes or so. If you want to stand up and have a stretch, first of all, please do. We'll take a couple of minutes. I won't offer you a tea break yet, but there may be some water you want to have a sip.
Okay. So just settling into your body, into your space and seeing how you can be most comfortable and ease. Allowing your body to decide, not your mind. And giving yourself permission to gently turn inward, disconnecting from any sense impressions from your computer screen, retaining the impression of this beautiful group of supportive friends. But gently closing your eyes and turning inward. And do take time to shuffle around a bit on your seat or in your bed, wherever you are. Not to cause restlessness, but just to really give your body that message that you care and that the body is important. One of the causes, I think, for a lack of being able to rejoice in others' happiness or success can actually be a low sense of self-worth. Sometimes we feel we don't deserve that or another person's happiness highlights perhaps some perceived lack in ourselves. One of the beauties about meditation is that there's no meaning in judging yourself. Nothing's actually expected of you now, nothing at all. Meditation is simply a gift that you give to yourself. And it's actually an expression of self-respect. You do value yourself enough to offer yourself a moment of peace. So see if you can just set aside any sense of expectation or pressure any meaningless comparisons between what you're experiencing now and what you imagine others to be experiencing. You may be surprised, (laughs) we're not so different. And just gently turn your attention inside. Noticing that you have a body. A body that's healthy enough to be here to meditate. And gently allowing your loving awareness to suffuse each and every part of the body. With eyes of gratitude.
and maybe parts of your body that are not so well. Maybe feelings that are uncomfortable or painful. But you'll also notice that most of your body, your eyes, your senses, your arms and hands, really working perfectly. You may have gastric diseases, but your lungs are working perfectly well. So notice how resourceful, how resilient and strong your body is. And see if you can send your body some gratitude. as though your awareness were like a gentle, loving smile. Touching each and every part, each and every cell of your body. Lingering in any areas that feel they need a little bit more attention, more care. Whilst also including any pleasant feelings. Perhaps relaxation, softening, tingling. Pleasant temperature. feeling of groundedness. Including it all. If you want to continue to simply spread this grateful, kind awareness through the body, please do so. For those who wish, I'd like to invite you in a short reflection to rouse, bring up, rejoice in your goodness. So just recognizing, first of all, that there is goodness here, there's beauty. Even though your mind may feel a 
little bit restless or anxious or tired. There's also kindness. There's also courage in showing up for yourself. There's wisdom that knows where your benefit truly lies. See if you can connect with that in your heart. Noticing any particular qualities that you respect and value in yourself. How does it feel to recognize and rejoice in those qualities? Can you open your heart to any uplift? <clears throat> Allowing this reflection to enrich, to gladden the heart. And allowing any gladness to suffuse your whole body. Relaxing your body more fully. Helping you soften and deepen more fully into now.
Once again, if you wish to just linger here, allow the meditation to naturally unfold, please do so. For those who wish, I'd like to invite you to bring to mind someone you know, maybe personally or perhaps a public figure a teacher, someone who seems to be on a good path, enjoying happiness, success in various areas of their life. Perhaps someone who inspires you helps you to see your own potential and goodness inside. And connecting with any happiness, joy, however subtle, any peace in your heart. Imagine dedicating this happiness, this joy to this other person. Rejoicing in sharing joy with them, rejoicing in their happiness. and allowing their happiness to deepen your own in a beautiful feedback loop. The more you share your joy with them, the happier you feel. And the more you recognize the joy within them, the more you can partake and drink in that joy until it becomes your own. If you wish, you can use some directed thought. Such as may they not be parted from their happiness and gain. Or may their happiness and joy increase. May I rejoice with them. So their happiness becomes my own.
and just looking at the quality of these intentions, trusting in that without looking for any particular experience or expecting anything special, trusting in the power of this beautiful joy, the generosity of sharing. To bring about your happiness in the long term for yourself and all beings. Staying connected to any feelings of peace, joy, calm inside your heart. Gently allowing that person to fade. Maybe gently saying goodbye, thank you. Letting them go. I'd like to invite you to bring to mind someone who you may have feelings of mild envy, maybe jealousy or resentment towards. Not someone who's harmed you very seriously or anyone you have really a lot too many difficulties with, just someone who you know that there's a, a slight blockage to feeling goodwill towards. And somebody who you can see is fairly happy has some good things going for them in life. And as you bring them into your awareness, see if you can notice some qualities that they have. Maybe some of the same qualities you recognize in yourself or in this other person you've been practicing with. Maybe different qualities. Something in this person worth rejoicing in. And see if that recollection can bring some uplift to your heart.
recognizing that if this person is experiencing happiness or success, it doesn't diminish your happiness. On the contrary, it may inspire them to do good and contribute to the greater good of all. So see if you can rejoice with them for any happiness or success they may experience. And if at any point during this process you find some obstacle or you even find resentment or more jealousy being aggravated in your heart, then just gently return to that goodness within you, to the qualities or the things in your life that you have to be grateful for. Gently letting that person go, bidding them farewell and returning to yourself, to your body and mind. Reconnecting once again. with your own inner goodness, anything at all that you value, respect within yourself. See if you can really breathe into that, open up to your goodness, allowing it to enrich and uplift your heart.
And to end the meditation, I'd like to invite you to now offer any happiness, peace, contentment that you've developed to offer the goodness of your life, the benefit of all beings. May all beings share in my joy. May all beings share in the goodness of my life. All beings in all realms of existence. Human or non-human. Far or near. All beings, may they too experience joy, the joy of a good heart, may they not be separated from their gains. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings experience the highest happiness of Nibbana. Gently thanking yourself for your own practice. Once again, smiling within. Smiling at your body. Smiling into your heart. And when you're ready, opening your eyes and smiling into this room. curious whether that worked how that worked what your experience was <laughs> maybe you could just pop a, a word into the chat if you wish um, we'll have more time to reflect later too but yeah I think that's the first time I've guided a mudita reflection so I'm not quite sure <laughs> how that worked. Someone said cathartic, that's great. <laughs> Peace and joy, gratitude, yay. This is wonderful. Oh, how nice. So this is the goodness of your practice, wonderful. Amazing. Oh, just reading these words, they have a certain energy, don't they? Oh, beautiful. Zoned out. That's also good. <laughs> oh, a bit blocked. Yeah. It's great when you do these Gamma Vihara practices because they tend to highlight any blockages that we might not know are there. Um, and that's why sometimes it's helpful to go through the categories as well, because if you just go straight into a sort of general spreading of metta, sometimes we can uh, miss areas where our hearts are still blocked. 
Um, and we find that when we face those same triggers in our life, we hope nothing much has changed, you know. So it's quite a, it can be quite a challenging practice, especially when we uh, work with more difficult people, perhaps where there is some resentment or ill will that's built up. Um, but I think the important thing is not to expect too much of ourselves, just to really respect our limitations as well. And realize that we can always go back to ourself, you know, especially if suffering starts to arise for us that is not easily overcome, then we become the ones most in need of our loving care. And perhaps sometimes the mudita may also just naturally change into a sense of compassion, you know, for when, when difficult emotions do arise. So I think there's a natural wisdom in these emotions. Um, and yeah, we can really trust the way they manifest or reveal our blockages to us. So very nice. Now it's almost time for some walking meditation. So I wanted to just give a few um, suggestions or tips. Um, a lot of you have your videos on, so maybe we can just have a quick show of hands for the people who are visible. Um, is there anyone who has not done walking meditation before? I'm just going to flick through the screens. Oh, you're all old pros, or young pros. <laughs> Great. So you will have some experience. And as I say, you know, any of these instructions, please don't take them that way. They're more invitations than kind of directions for the practice. So um, please do the walking meditation however feels most resourcing, most joyful for you. Um, my suggestion, my invitation would be simply to notice the delight and the joy of simply being able to be present for just one step, just being able to walk, having our body functioning well enough that we can actually, you know, take one step at a time. So as your um, feet move, <laughs> You'll probably find you're moving in a slower way than the natural walking pace, but it's really up to you. Don't make it too um, tilted or unnatural. You'll probably find that as your awareness increases, the speed of the walking will slow down because you start to notice more and more. So if you're indoors, try to find an area, maybe the biggest room where you have like a length of that room to walk in. Or, I mean, it's a bit chilly, but you could wrap up, depending where you are, I don't know, in California, it might be a bit better. And, uh, and you can find a quiet place outside also. And just take a length of, uh, of ground, maybe about between seven and 15 steps. Yeah, depending what you wish. And the idea is just to settle yourself, first of all, standing. You know, feel the touch of your feet on the ground, feel the weight of your body and feel that intention to walk. And just notice the joy of being able to take one step. Yeah. I think it's, was it Thich Nhat Hanh who says that you can walk as though each foot is kissing the ground. This is also very nice, feeling joy in that connection. Yeah. And then just noticing as your foot moves, what sort of sensations you experience and how those sensations change as you put the foot gently to the ground and the weight shifts, you know, from maybe the heel into the front of the foot. And then again, how it feels to lift the next foot, the sensations that you feel in that foot as you lift, and as you move, maybe you notice they're a bit lighter than as they come down to the ground. So you may be able to explore the field of weight, perhaps the field of temperature, um, whatever arises in your mind. And also, generally speaking, it can be nice to focus on the feet, but if your mind feels it wants a bit more space, you can focus on the whole, or you can make your awareness more expansive. So you notice the whole leg or even the whole body. So whatever really feels good to you and brings up a sense of joy, a sense of lightness, gratitude, appreciation for the walking posture. So is, are there any questions on that before we break for lunch? Because that's a kind of very vague instruction. Um, maybe we could stop the recording just so that anybody who has a question could ask it anonymously. <laughs> 